Welcome to the Richesum Reverse Engineering Channel. In this video, I'm going to add a tiny connector back onto this smart meter and try to talk to its main microcontroller. This is basically the brain of the smart meter, and being able to talk to it is the next step in our journey. Previously, I told you I wanted to create a mod chip that will let anyone read out the firmware in this smart meter. This won't quite turn it into an open source device, but it will let us better understand how it functions. In the prior videos, I go into more depth on the steps, but let me catch you up in case you missed them. First, I used a development board to test out my theory on voltage glitching and made random faults occur. Building off of that, in the next video, I put tighter parameters around when the glitch was generated so I could cause specific faults, such as dumping the firmware on the development board. Then, I needed to transition from the development board to an actual smart meter. But smart meters run on 240 volts, and I didn't want to blow up my equipment or shock the crap out of myself. So I came up with a way for the meters to run on 12 volts by injecting a low voltage sine wave at 60 hertz, which simulates the AC voltage the meter expects to see. That brings us to this video, where I'm going to hook up my programming interface to the smart meter and attempt to reprogram it. There are two generations of smart meters I've been looking at, Gen 4 and Gen 5. The main difference is the processor used. The older one uses an M16C processor, and the newer one uses an ARM Cortex-M. I've seen more people online work on reverse engineering the ARM Cortex, so I wanted to focus on extracting the firmware from that processor, since more people will likely be able to analyze it, and more binary analysis tools such as Ghidra support it. Now when it came to adding the programming connector, I had a good idea where I should start. These little gray rectangles on the circuit board are called a footprint, and this shape is the telltale sign a connector goes here. When reverse engineering something that has a radio transmitter inside, I generally start with data from the Federal Communications Commission. Searching for the FCC ID is the easiest way to see pictures of the internal parts of many devices. Simply making a note of the FCC ID for any device is a great way to gather some initial intelligence. Part of the FCC certification process is publishing this information online. Some devices will have more information available than others though, so don't be surprised if on newer devices there are confidentiality notices and no internal photos, as was the case with this smart water meter. But don't worry, you can now find more details on it than they ever wanted on the Richesum Wiki. Funny enough though, in the case of this meter, the engineers testing it were using one of their development boards to get the FCC certification. I can tell from this photo that's posted online, clearly showing two connectors and some other components on the board that aren't on any boards I have. Also, it's obviously red, and this one is green. Hardware designers use different colors sometimes to keep track of the stages of their designs. The connectors were likely there, so they could make changes on the fly to how much power the device uses to transmit or the communication algorithm which could affect the overall emission certification. Devices have to stay under a certain threshold to pass, or they won't get the FCC ID needed to sell their product. Of course, the FCC is specific to the United States. Other countries have their own version of this, possibly with more or less information available online. What's interesting is adding this connector means the board can no longer fit in the enclosure. So I wonder how this board was actually tested in the enclosure, or if it wasn't at all, and they just set it on a table, or had a modified enclosure like what I am using. Now the simplest way to wire up this programming header is to connect it directly to the pins on the microcontroller. On the development board, you can see that's exactly what the engineers did. There's some pull-up resistors, but the pins of the chip are wired directly to this connector. In the case of this smart meter though, the engineers added these tiny zero ohm resistors into the design and then didn't install them, severing the connection. These are like little hidden keys we have to put back before I don't know for sure the resistors they used are zero ohm. But considering on the development board design it was wired directly, I'd say it's a safe bet. If you don't know, 
A zero ohm resistor is basically just a wire in a resistor package. Zero ohms is what you get on your meter when you directly connect the probes together and hear a tone. So instead of trying to hunt around for tiny resistors the size of salt grains, I just decided to make my own with some solder and tiny wires. Copying the locations in the picture is one way to know where they need to go. To be sure though, I also used the continuity tester on my multimeter to check each pin on the chip was going to the pin on the connector I was expecting. These JTAG connectors have a standard pinout. And another clever technique that a manufacturer could use is to swap these pins around so when you plug in your standard programming cable, it won't work. I've always wondered if there was a manufacturer with the audacity to intentionally try to fry your programmer by swapping power pins or injecting in higher voltages. Of course, doing that means they have to make custom cables for all their software developers, and it's more hassle than it's worth, I bet. Now, we simply connect the programmer, read out the firmware, and post it online for everyone to see. Yo, kinda feel like God. If only it was that easy. For some devices, it really is. But on this meter, they have enabled a form of protection that prevents me from connecting to the chip in any way. Most microcontrollers have a way of locking down access after all the development work is done. Engineers spend their time writing code and debugging the devices and use these ports to read out memory locations and debug their code. But once that is done, they don't want anyone else to get access to that code for various reasons. It's also possible the code wasn't written with security in mind. Encryption keys or algorithms might be easy to figure out if you could see the code. Think of this as the door on a bank vault. It's meant to only allow authorized people inside, people who already know what's inside, and will close the door behind them. Now like a bank vault, the interior might be designed in a very secure way, expecting that someone could break through and having additional layers of security inside. Unlike a bank vault though, there's no time limit to how long I can try to break open the main door and the subsequent locked boxes once I get inside. This is the main difference between attacking a physical location and sitting in my lab attacking these devices. The bank manager isn't going to show up in the morning to find me inside. The error message I get when I try to connect to the meter doesn't reassure me that I've done everything correct though. I don't know for sure if every solder joint is perfect or if there isn't some other booby trap that I missed. I was kind of hoping for a message like, good job hash. I can see the microcontroller, and here's the part number I read, but you can't go in. What I decided to do was unplug the programmer and plug it back into the development board that I know works. I never actually set the security bit, so I don't know what to expect once that has happened. In this case, literally the exact same thing happens, which is great. It still doesn't confirm if I wired things up correctly, but it gave me hope that I did. Now. Once you enable this security feature, there is no way through this programmer to turn it off or even access the chip to erase it and start over. As you can see, clicking erase doesn't do anything. I tried a few times on both boards. The only way is to set this erase pin high and then reboot the board. On the development board, this is easy. They installed a jumper you can use. On the smart meter, no such luck. The hardware guys did realize that making this pin more accessible is a good thing though, so they wired it to this test point. Connecting from here to pin 1 on the JTAG connector with 3.3 volts erases the meter and finally allows me to connect. I feel alive! Now, I know what you must be thinking. Hash, you just lost all the data. What the hell are you celebrating for? For the record, I'm not. Johnny 5 was celebrating, and I'm happy for him, because number 5 is truly alive. Seriously though, there are steps to this process of dumping the firmware, and the step we are on is profiling the hardware so we can find out what glitch parameters we need to use. You'll recall in my finding a glitch video that the physical properties of the circuit board 
and even the length and gauge of wire I use affects whether the glitch works or not. What I can do, now that I have programming access, is load my test program I used on the development board onto this smart meter. I'll precisely measure and cut some wire to use for the voltage glitch connection to the chip whisper, which is the tool I use to cause faults in the processor. Once I replicate the success I had on the development board on this smart meter and dump out my test firmware, I will solder all the same hardware onto a meter that still has its firmware intact from the factory. At that point, I will have all the glitch parameters I need and a known good JTAG connection. I can then begin the process of attacking a locked down smart meter, but not as blindly as if I didn't do all these steps in between. In the next video, we'll see what the glitch parameters turned out to be, and if I was actually able to replicate the attack using my golden test meter. If you like this video, make sure to leave a comment and subscribe. I use your questions and comments to inspire future videos and set the direction of my research. For detailed images and documentation, make sure to check out the Richesum Wiki and join the Discord if you feel like chatting with other people about projects you're working on. I live my life a quarter mile at a time. If you live your life 15 seconds at a time, you can also find me on TikTok. Thanks for watching.